the mysteries of the kingdom of God, uh, of the principles of the keys. Lord of heaven, establish your goodwill concerning us by your word today and let it impact our lives. Give us hearing ears and seeing eyes as we hear your word in the name of Jesus. What I intend to do today is to refresh us again on a lot of things we've been saying since this year began on the subject of the kingdom of God. Amen? And I have talked about the king and the kingdom in understanding the operations of this, we need to understand also what connects the king and his kingdom. There's something in between. They are called keys of the kingdom. How do you enter a house without a key? How do you assess a chest? A chest has treasures in it, right? Without a key. Key grants access you know that so we have the king we have the king we have the kingdom but we need access do you understand it now and the keys commands access so but today i just go on a refresher journey on some things we've said even as we go into this subject we just read in luke 8 and verse 10 he said, unto you, it is given to know. And you see, he was talking to his disciples. He was not talking to the general congregation that he, was, he preached to. As a matter of fact, he gave a parable openly, right? And um, when he came back, the disciples said, excuse me, I thought you came to minister to these people, but you keep talking to them in parables. And Jesus said, you need to understand something. Unto you, you know, it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. He said to them that are without, it is not given. That means unbelievers don't have access to the keys of the kingdom. Do you get my point? But it is for you so that you can access what the kingdom has for you. So let me refresh us again today on some of the things we have talked about concerning the king and the kingdom. Remember, we have established it that the Lord Jesus Christ's message while he was on earth was very clear. Matthew 4, 17, where he started, he said, repent for what the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what I brought for you. That's what he said. His message was very clear, established, and he taught about the kingdom all through his ministry to the point that when after resurrection and when he was going, if you remember, the disciples said, excuse me, sir, you are going, but what of the kingdom you've been talking about all this while? Wouldn't you give it to us so that we can start ruling the town? You remember in Acts? They said, will you at this town restore the kingdom again unto Israel? Because that's all they had him talk about. And in fact, that's all he talked about. So essentially, what we have said is that the purpose of God for man in creation was to administer a kingdom. Adam was like a king on earth when he was made, before he fell. Man was created to administer the kingdom. In fact, that's why God told him, I'll put you here, exercise dominion. That means rule over here. Do you understand me? Be in charge here. That's all that God told man. And when Adam fell, he lost that kingdom. Hence, redemption in Christ, was primarily and is still primarily to restore the kingdom that man obviously lost. We have talked about that. Glory to God. Adam was not restored to heaven. 
Adam never heard anything about heaven in his life, if you understand me. He was made for here to rule here. He lost that rulership. Hence, man has been under the devil until Jesus came to restore back what man lost, which is the kingdom, the rulership of the earth. And that's the fulfillment of God's will, which is the reestablishment of his kingdom on earth. Glory to God. Because of that, it, it, it brought us the, the, the program of salvation, got us reconciled back to himself, and left us here as his ambassadors. But of course, we keep hearing the word kingdom, and I ask again, what is a kingdom? Remember I said today, I just refresh us again as we go into the keys of the kingdom. In a kingdom, the most important person is the king. And in a kingdom, the king is sovereign. What does that mean? What does it mean the king is sovereign? Did I have fault? Um. When you hear in kingdoms, where they still have kingdom today, they don't even say the king says so, so and so. They just say the sovereign say. That means he is absolutely, totally in charge. You get it now. Sovereign, directly, totally, absolutely over it all. Second, when you talk of a kingdom, you are talking of a territory. There is no kingdom without a territory. We have established that also. You cannot be king of nothing. You have to be a king over somewhere. Thirdly, a kingdom must have citizens. Hence, we are called kingdom citizens. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And that's very important. A kingdom has citizens. The citizens are called subjects. And that word too is also significant because we are subject. Talking of something being subjugated, being subjected, because the king is sovereign. Amen? I said amen. Also, in a kingdom, there is what you call the constitution, which is a bit different from the constitution you have in the world today, the republics of the world. The constitution of this world or the republics were made by the people. But in a kingdom, it's not so. The constitution is the word of the king. You get the point. It's the word of the king. Here you can change constitution if you don't like it. You get my point. You can vote in and vote out. There's nothing like that in a kingdom. It's just the word of the king. The word of the king is documented as the constitution. Where the word of the king is, there is what? Power, the Bible says. And we may say, why dwells thou what? Constitution. That's the covenant between the king and his subjects. Also, a kingdom has laws. And that's where we are going, maybe next week. Those are what you call the principles, how it functions. Every kingdom operates and functions by law. In a kingdom, remember we said the word of the king is law. Also, most importantly, the kingdom has a government. And what do you mean by government? A ruling authority. A ruling authority. It's a form of um, the order of authority to which people follow. Where there is no order, there is chaos. And I always remember that every time I travel back home, you see the same people who live with you here, they drive peacefully, don't over speed. You know what I mean? The same people get back home to Nigeria, for example, where there is no order. Oh, every time I go home, it's so frustrating to drive. 
because I want to drive, I'm driving to drive like I'm driving here, but you're going nowhere because everybody is like this, facing themselves, blocking the road. No order. Where there is no functional governmental authority, where there is no order, what you have is what? Chaos. And that, that's a disaster that uh, a place that ought to be beautiful is not made to look like a jungle because we lose that order. The word government actually means order of authority. A lot of things work here because of that order of authority. Even when you are in power here, you still know you are under authority, you know, uh, like where some places break everything. So that's, that's, we need to understand that when it comes to a kingdom. That's why the Bible is speaking in Romans 12, 1 and 2, telling us, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that is seriously significant also. You see, when you hear this world, it's not talking about the planet. It's talking about the governing influence here. That's what it's talking about. Don't be conformed to it. And I think I should do a little on that for a moment. That is, renew your mind with a new set of thinking. The word world, what does it mean? It also means governing authority, or order of authority. It's telling us not to be subjected or controlled by the governing authority of this world. You know, since man fell, Satan became what? The God of this world. So it's, it's, a case, it's a case of two kingdoms. He has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. So it's all about two kingdoms. So why you are here or not, under whose governing authority are you? The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of darkness? There is no middle point. It's telling us not to be controlled by the other kingdom's government. Remember, we are fighting against kingdoms. It's one kingdom against another. Look at Colossians 1 verse 13. Who are delivered us from the power of darkness. Are you delivered? I said, are you delivered from the power of darkness? Are you sure? Okay. Colossians 1 13. Who had delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. If you read it in the new translation, new living translation, he said, For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. So you are taken out of one kingdom into another. Listen to this. If you have been taken out from that kingdom, should you still be ruled by that kingdom? Should you still be subjected by that kingdom? Should you still be under the influence of that kingdom? That's the big question a lot of us have to answer. Because we have been used to that old kingdom of darkness. It's taught us how to think, taught us how to act, trained us, conditioned us. And then here, we get saved, and we are now transferred into the kingdom of God. But we still carry the same mind. Are you following? That's why the Bible now says, now that you are in this kingdom, renew your mind to suit this kingdom so that you don't keep operating as though you are in this kingdom. You get my point? That's all it's talking about. It's not about church. It's about life. Because if you don't change your thinking, remember, as he thinks, so is he. You say you are saved, you are a child of God, you are a citizen of the kingdom, but you still think the old way, you still speak the old way, you still behave the old way, you still act the old way, you are still conformed to the old way. So that's who you are. The kingdom of darkness 
literally has a government and it controls every human being that comes into this world. Hence, David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. You get my point now? It's, we are already under that control until salvation comes. So we need to know that. The devil is called 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world. And remember, Ephesians tells us, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's why you understand this when the Lord Jesus Christ was praying in John 17, I believe. Well, let's start from John 15, verse 19. He said, if ye were of this world, you will love, the world will love his own. But because ye are not of this world, but I have chosen you, look at that word. I have chosen you what? Can somebody read that for me? I have chosen you out of. Did you see that word? I have chosen you out of the world, but you are still here. That's what I need you to understand. This is your world. We may both be in the same location, but we are in different worlds. We have been taken out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. We are not under the kingdom of Satan or the governing influence of Satan. We are now under the government of heaven. John 17, verse 14. He said, I have given them thy word. Watch. And the word hated them. Because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. Listen. I have given them the word. When you receive the word, you become transformed. So as many as received him to them, gave you power to become the sons of God. The word became flesh. When you receive the word, you become transformed. You become changed. You become translated. I have given them thy word. And because of that, they are no longer of this world. Note that. Even still today, it is as you dwell on the word. That's why I said, through the renewing of your mind. It is the word that affects the change. Amen? Verse 15, John 17. He said, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We need to get this, to be able to wake up every morning and say, Satan, you have no control over me. You have no control over my body. You have no control over my business. You have no control over my life. You have no control over my, 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 my job. You have no control. I'm not under your authority. I'm not under your authority. I am not of this world. That is our privilege as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. I remember that every kingdom has privileges. Very important. For you to be given a right in a kingdom, it is a privilege. That's the difference between this system of the world and that of the kingdom of God. Because a kingdom, what you call rights, are privileges. Privileges bestowed on you by the king. You don't go to claim rights with the king. Hence, you know what the Bible says, we are saved by what? By grace. That's the privilege of the believer. Everything in this kingdom is by grace. And grace is the favor of the king. The king gives you grace. Grace is the favor of the king. Have you read Osea? Give me Osea chapter 2 verse 23. Osea chapter 2 verse 23. And I will sow her unto me in the earth. And I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will sow to them which are not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. That means the way the New Testament puts it is I will 
have mercy on whom I will have mercy. That is to say, look, in a, in a republic or the, the system of the world, you do something, you pay for it. Right? But in a kingdom, even when you have done all that you are worthy of death, the king can say what? You are free. And nobody can question it. The king can say, take that gift to him. Nobody can question it. Do you understand me? That's what we call grace. The favor of the king. This month, God will favor you. I said this month, God will favor you. The favor of the king is here for you today. And by this favor, men will go out of their way to give to you this month. I thought you would say a big amen to that. Hallelujah. That's the favor of the king. That's why in every time we try to entreat his favor. He said, even the rich among men shall be there with a gift. The daughter of Shaitai shall entreat your favor with gifts. Everybody is seeking the favor of the king because he said, in his favor is life. Have you read before that promotion comes not from anywhere but from God? Huh? Psalm 75. Verse 6, he said, for promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south, but God is judge. He puts down one and sets up another. When God sets you up, nobody can bring you down. Amen? And may God not be the one putting you down because nobody can bring you up. That's the favor of the king. I said this month, the favor of the king will answer for you. The favor of the king will answer for you. This month, God is setting you up because he's the one that promotes. In the name of Jesus, be ye promoted. Where they thought they are going to put you down, then the favor of the Lord answers for you, then you are promoted. And people are wondering, how did, how did that happen? What happened? How did you get it? Just say, it's the favor of the Lord. Because when he favors you, the world will hear you. When he favors you, the world will give to you. When he look at it, he did it with Saul. His favor located Saul, the king, before David, and he began to give to him. In closing, I will say also there are a code of ethics in the kingdom. That's the lifestyle, the culture of the kingdom. The, things king, the king tolerates. The things the king don't tolerate. When you violate the king's code, you forfeit the benefits because you lose his favor. Please understand that the Lord Jesus Christ actually brought us a government. And the Bible says it. The first introduction of him in scripture was Isaiah 9, I believe, verse 6. For to us a child was born and a son is given, and he said, and the government. That's the first thing he said. The government shall be upon his shoulder. He takes over the responsibility. And that's why he said, I am the one in charge here. My government is the one ruling here. If you abide in me and my word abide in you, then you go ask what you will, I will give it. So you don't break the ethics. When you abide and go by the word, that's why we want to look at the keys. The privileges, the benefits will continually flow. The kingdom is here. Can I hear you say the kingdom is here? I didn't say this. I said, can I hear you say the kingdom is here? Aha. Uh -huh. The kingdom is here. And I want to trust God. That ends forth as you go from today, you keep seeing the manifestation of the kingdom in your life. So the devil has no hold over you. The devil has no grip over you. The devil has no control over your life. The devil has no room to manifest where you are. The devil has nothing to do where you are because you are in charge there as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven.
God has chosen to, to have mercy on you. He said, I will have mercy. A woman will have mercy, pure and simple. The mercy of God secures favor for you this month in the name of Jesus. The mercy of God, the mercy of God. It secures, our, it secures favor for us this month, the month of the Lord's release. That's what the favor of God does. You remember Esther went before the king, contrary to the law of the land. By the law of the land, she was to be what? Executed. But then the king held out the golden scepter, right? The king held out the golden scepter. That's favor. And death was taken away. That's all we're talking about. Whatever you have been condemned for by acts of omission or commission, whatever you are due of contamination, the favor of God secures your release today in the name of Jesus. I say the favor of God secures your release today in the name of Jesus. Favor bestow honor. So all this, throughout this month, you will enjoy his honor. You will enjoy his honor all through this month in the name of Jesus. I said it, I'm saying it to you today. This month, you will be promoted by the hand of God that no man can withstand. You will enjoy the promotion of God. There will be a change of level for you this month in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We give you praise. Please, let's rise up on our feet. Jesus is Lord. I'd like you to say it. I, Lord, I receive your favor. Receive God's favor. Receive God's favor. Lord, I receive your favor. I receive your favor this month. That your favor will continually manifest in my life all through this month. This month, I shall be promoted. That which I have been condemned of. That which I have been judged and found guilty of. That that has been written <coughs> against me. This month, I receive by the mercy of God, the favor of God. Mercy turns it around in my favor. Mercy said, death is abolished. Mercy said, your judgment is taken away. Mercy says, the king favors you. So I receive the favor of the Lord this month. In the name of Jesus, every act of condemnation is taken away. Every act of judgment of death is taken away. Every debt is taken away. I receive the favor of God that puts me over and above and brought me promotion from heaven. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We give you praise. Lord, we receive your favor this month. From this day forward, we begin to swim in the ocean of God's favor. Because it has pleased you, the King, to favor us. We walk in the same as men begin to bring to us from right, from left, from every angle. Because we are now the favor of the Lord. As increase begins to answer to us from every corner, because we are now the favor of the Lord. As the light of God shines upon us, and promotion comes our way, because now we are the favor of the Lord. Our judgment is taken away. Oh, our iniquity is pardoned. We give you praise, mighty God, in the name of Jesus. We bless your name. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name.